News with educator Isola Foster. She speaks about problems in American schools that she says stem from the politics of cultural identity in our society. Her comments were made earlier this month at a forum hosted by the John Birch Society in Dedham, Massachusetts. Ms. Foster was a teacher in Watts, California, and the South Central area of Los Angeles for nearly three decades. She's a columnist for Headway Magazine and the author of the book, What's Right for All Americans. Thank you. It's always good to be among friends. I'm usually out debating or fighting over issues with those who do not believe. It's, it's not that we're pe preaching to the choir, but we do have to get the message out to everyone. Actually, I've been teaching for 33 years, and during that time I have seen some major changes in our public schools. Basically what has happened is that our children are being educated today to become world citizens rather than American citizens. And that is very, very dangerous. When I first started teaching, the trend then was values clarification. Now I have to tell you, my values were very clear. So I didn't quite understand why the schools were in the business of clarifying values. Well, I learned that really what it meant was that our children was to not have a value system at all. And this came about actually in the, uh, long before I came into teaching with the introduction of psychology and psychiatry into our public school system. And I remember uh, Fondike who said, and his theory rang true with the rest of those who have um, demonized our children, that man has no soul and only react to stimuli. And that is the way our children are being taught. And of course, they have no soul because their soul was taken out of their teaching in that 1962 act that took God out of our schools. Had nothing to do with separation of church and state. What it meant was to take away from our children a sense of direction, of guidance for their young lives. Now, I am very critical of the movements of the 60s. I blame them for much of the ills that's facing our country today. The Chicano movement has given our schools overcrowded classrooms funding that is just taken over educational funding now with bilingual funds. As a matter of fact, that's what that Ebonics thing was all about, money. Um, bilingual funding is the biggest gold pot now of educational funding. And black teachers, black students were not considered minority um, bilingual because they are American and they speak English. So our illustrious black leaders decided that no, they're not American, they're African, and no, they don't speak English, they speak Ebonics. And as a result, now they also are getting some of this bilingual funding. Uh, I also blame the feminist movement because they have turned our little girls into wanting to be little boys. They have turned our young women against uh, men. They have brought in abortion on demand anytime, any place, anywhere, with, with or without parental consent. And I also blame the homosexual movement because they are in our schools now and they are pushing these programs that are detrimental to the lives of our young people and to the future of America. But most important, am I distressed with the political black movement? I am distressed because I am part of the race, the race of people who were brought here as slaves and are now being used to enslave all of America. And I see this in our public schools. We in, in Los Angeles, the second largest school district in America, have all of these groups ingrained in teachers unions. You have your gay and lesbian commission for your school board and your, your teachers union. Uh, your what they call African American commission. Your Chicano or Mexican American commission. Your all, you name it, Native American. And they've divided our people into all of these groups each with their own agenda and they're using our children as political pawns to support their agenda. Now 
What bothers me most about the movement is because I was part of it at one time because I bought into the fact that the more political power we have, the more freedom, not so. And I look at what's happened to our young people. Now, I really do not recall going from being colored to Negro. I remember in the 40s and 50s growing up as a Negro, and all Negro meant was that our ancestors were brought to America as slaves from Africa. That was it, plain and simple. However, the 60s brought in the peak of the political movements, and so the black leaders decided that we were no longer to be called Negro, and that from now on we were to be referred to as blacks. Well, again, I was fresh out of college, didn't bother me too much. I thought, well, great, you know, that'll mean more political power. I bought into it also. And then after the um, media brought attention to the fight, against apartheid in South Africa. The Reverend Ain't Jesse Jackson held a press conference and told the media from now on refer to us as African American. And since that time we've been known as African Americans. Well there's another name change on the horizon for us. They're going to take us back to being people of color. The reason is that uh, they are so busy promoting illegal immigration and they feel that most of the illegals, especially in California where it's really a big problem, our downtown Los Angeles is like a third world country, but we have two and three thousand people coming over the border on a daily basis. Um, we're about to go bankrupt in so many areas, but most of the people coming in are from Mexico, quite simply because Mexico, the proximity makes us right across the border is much easier. So um, whatever group of people would be living right on our border, we would have more of them. But they're considered people of color. And so as I debated with the head of the NAACP and the Urban League on the issue of Proposition 187, throughout the entire debates, they continue to refer to us as people of color. So again, that's the next name change on the horizon. Now, what does that mean? In our public schools, particularly in Los Angeles, and believe me folks, it happens there, it's on its way to your communities also. You might identify with some of the programs that I'm going to talk about tonight. They may be coming into your communities under a different name, but they're coming in. And one of the things that these groups have brought into us is the fact that old glory is not even flying in our American public schools anymore. Many of the classrooms are void of old glory, but they have foreign flags flying. And unfortunately for us, for our little black children, they are being told to pledge allegiance to an African-American flag, a flag that's just been made up. Now, some of you may be familiar with those. And let, before I go on, I want to explain to you, when I talk about the black leaders, I want you to know exactly who I'm talking about. I am talking about the NAACP, the Urban League, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Congressional Black Caucus, um, Jackson and his group, and Calypso Lloyd, Farrakhan and his group all of them, because they coalesce as one, and they have a chokehold on the black community. And if you think I'm kidding, just remember what O.J. Simpson told the jurors in his closing arguments. Remember, you have to go back to the community. What that means is that these groups have control over the community. Now, why is that frightening? Because you have had gangsters like Crips and Bloods who have maimed and killed our innocent young children going back and forth to school, who have killed innocent young children while sitting in their living rooms watching TV. Many of you don't realize it, but these are children of parents who have bucked the system, of parents who have tried to complain about what's wrong. So there is no way that these groups could have grown to the prominence that they are today without the leadership of the community there to support them and their growth. So that is what I mean about the chokehold on the community. And in our classrooms, there is also a pledge of allegiance to, uh, I guess, this African-American flag. Our children do not know that this great nation of ours is a republic because they don't pledge allegiance to the republic for which we stand. And so they're confused and they don't understand it. Their loyalty is not to their own country. And how has this come about? It's all because of our involvement in the United Nations. The United Nations Educational, Scientific, 
and cultural organization, UNESCO, has dictated these problems for us in our public schools because they have dictated the policies and the programs. And you've heard of some of these programs. I just mentioned values clarification. Uh, you get them in different names, behavior modification, peer counseling, uh, group counseling, um, and then, of course, your sex education and your health education, and you name it, AIDS education. And I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, in some of these AIDS education classes where they talk about safe versus unsafe sex, some of the things that our children are being introduced to as sex acts, many of you would never even dream of entertaining or being a part of. So they have, they have broken down the, the, the willpower of our children. That's why you will hear them say, oh, well, our children are going to have sex anyway, so we might as well tell them to, uh, what to do or what to use and so forth. It's nonsense. And the reason they're saying that is because they are the ones who are breaking down their willpower. Now, again, made up flag, made up pledge of allegiance, made up culture, Kwanzaa. Now, I'm sure some of you have heard of it. I happen to have known the man who started this. It came from the top of his head. And I believe me, when I say this, he just made it up. His name is Ron Karinga. He worked at a school. We worked both at a, uh, an adult school at the time, early 60s. And he formed an organization called U.S., United Slaves. He and his U.S. followers had a shootout with the Black Panthers in the cafeteria of UCLA, where two people were killed. He was sentenced for torturing two of his female followers. He resurfaced, gave himself an African name, and now he's head of black studies at one of our major universities in California. Does that matter? No. Now Hallmark has 15 different varieties of the, of the uh, car. Texaco got in trouble because they would not recognize it as a holiday. And it's made up. What an insult to black Americans. And that is an insult to our children. And where is it coming from? It's coming from a concerted effort to divide America. Divide America and also dissolve America. And that is the purpose for all of this. Now, I'll give you a good example of what I'm talking about uh, in terms of this leadership. When the CNN did coverage of um, the Militia Man March, and I know some of you think it's the Million Man March, but it is the Militia Man March because this was Farrah Khan's way of showing his military might. And the reason he had so many young men there because his Farrah Khan's lieutenants were speaking from the pulpit of our Christian churches encouraging these young men to come there. And many of them were innocent and not realizing what was going on. So I'm sitting in CNN studios in Los Angeles waiting to be interviewed as Leon Harris is interviewing two uh, young men, a crippling of blood, from the site in our nation's capital. And these two little gangsters said, well, you know, the reason that we did what we did to our community is because of lack of leadership. And that's why we're here to support Minister Farrakhan. Lack of leadership, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what the leadership was for these two gangster groups who have terrorized our community so. The most powerful politician in the state of California at the time, some say even more than the governor, was Willie Brown, black. Their congressman at the time, Augustus Hawkins, black. Their state senator, black. Their state assembly representative, Murky Waters, Maxine to you. Their mayor, Tom Bradley. And they had, uh, the city councilman had been on the city council so long, he was known as the emperor. Now you tell me, with that kind of leadership over Watson, South Central Los Angeles, we should have had the closest-knit families, the highest-achieving schools, the safest streets. But no, during that period, U.S. News and World Report, Newsweek, Time, all writing about us because we were known as the killing fields, the war zone. This is Beirut, USA. 
That is what that leadership gave Watson South Central Los Angeles, and that is what they are spreading throughout America. Because, as Farrakhan talks about a separate nation, I haven't heard any one of them. Instead of opposing it, they join in solidarity with him. And that is very, very frightening. And it hurts me because I can see the effects of our, on our young children. Even when they call themselves African-American, the first thing I say to them is, what country are you from? They don't know that Africa is a continent with many countries, each with its own flag, each with its own culture. But it, it is so sad that this is what is happening to our young children. So we have the mental breakdown. You have all kind of mental health um, institutions coming onto our campuses. We have our children that's being drugged by the schools. You've heard all the talk about Ritalin. And when you get this magazine on education, it will answer all of your questions because the New American Magazine on education covers all of these issues that I'm talking about and even more. But can you imagine that our public schools are now in the business of drugging our children? And more than that, they are now bringing what's called healthy start on our school campuses. We just had a, a school in, in Los Angeles, the first one, and you know, when it's just like the camel. When he gets his neck in the tent, you may as well let him all the rest of the way in. That's what's happening. When it starts in Los Angeles, look for it. Healthy start. Now they have a full-time doctor and full-time nurses on campus. So your children don't have to come to you with any problems. None. They get a referral for abortion without your permission. If they have a tummy ache and whatever the problems may be, they don't have to complain to you. The doctor is right there to take care of it. Now, at one time, it used to be that the students needed permission just to take an aspirin. No more. They're, well, the students will get in trouble if they don't go to the nurse. They get something heavier than, than aspirins now. But these are some of the problems that's facing us in our school system. Uh, not only the drugs that are given to them, but the discipline. It's a problem. It's a problem because I can tell you as a teacher, if you do not have control of your classroom and if you do not speak truth with the children, they can tell that and they can tell when you're honest and you're, and you're not. So what happens is some of our young children come to school and they're much brighter than the teachers who are teaching them. So they become a discipline problem. And how do we do that? We of course give them a drug to calm them down. Now, I've seen a lot since I've been in, in the education system, and I've complained a lot about what's going on in our system. Um, I remember at the school at which I spent the last 11 years, most of the children are there illegally or they are, their parents are here illegally. So the teachers' union representative at the school decided to show her government and social studies classes a film called The Wrath of Grapes, which is about Cesar Chavez and the grape pickers and so forth, and just build up the emotions of the children as they looked at, at the film showing uh, young children who were maimed and disabled because their parents picked grapes while they were pregnant and so forth. And so after the teacher got them so emotionally involved, the teacher says, now, for class credit, you can join us at the market, neighborhood market on Saturday for a great boycott. And all you have to do is hold the protest signs, join us on the picket line, you're gonna get class credit for that. Well, my students, whether they're here legally or not, they know that as long as they're in my charge, I'm going to take care of them. So they came to me and told me about it. And I went to this later and I said, you can't do that. You can't use our children like that. And I stopped it. But now they're doing it through community service which is going to be mandated. So if your child will go and join a picket line that they are, are, of course, you have to be of their ideology. You cannot be politically incorrect. That's community service. And it's mandated in some of the school boards. We have a um, program in our um, school system there. And again, I understand from some people that I'm talking to, it's coming into your areas too. In Los Angeles, it started around the mid-70s. Actually, <clears throat> there was a counselor at a high school there 
a lesbian who was entrusted with the care of a young girl for a weekend competition, had an affair with the young girl and decided, well now, 10% of our students are homosexual. So she came up with a program called Project 10. Now, when it was introduced, the idea was to counsel young children. Now, can you imagine a homosexual telling a child with the potential that, no, you know, it's a very dangerous and unhealthy lifestyle? It's a recruitment program. Now, many schools try to avoid it, even when it's passed. And how does it pass? If, when it's placed on the agenda at the school board, parents hear about it, they fill up the school boards and protest. Well, the school board members decide they're going to move it down on the agenda. So the meeting started at 3 o'clock. Here it is, 4, 5, 6. Sometimes they go until 9 o'clock at night to wear down the parents. And then when no one's not looking, it passes and it's approved. The fact of the matter is these programs are already approved and ready to be implemented before they're even brought to the parents. But at any rate, this Project 10 came in and at my school, it had been there for quite some time. Nobody really paid much attention to it until a couple of uh, homosexual teachers came and they decided to popularize the program. Well, I had been on a show entitled, Should Homosexuals Have the Right to Marry and Raise Children? And my students saw me on the show. So the next day, as they always do when they see me on these television shows, they want a little discussion before we start our lesson. And they asked me, well, Ms. Foster, what do you think about Project 10? And I gave them my opinion. A couple of days later, the uh, director of Project 10 walked into my classroom and said he wanted to talk to me. And I said, fine. I'm thinking we're going to walk outside of the door. But he stops me in the middle of the floor in front of all of my class. And he says, I understand you said thus and so about Project 10. And I said, yes, I said that, and I'll tell you what else I said. And I went on to give him my full opinion. So when he walked out of the door, the students <clears throat> applauded. And I said, why are you doing that? You already know my opinion. And they said, oh, no, Ms. Foster, when we go into his classroom, we're going in there for our math class. He has these posters of half-naked men in sexually alluring positions, some near, darn near kissing. And it's so embarrassing, we can't concentrate on our math. And I said, well, have you told your parents? Well, as I said, most of their parents are here illegally and they don't want to get involved. And I said, well, have you told the other teachers? And they, yes, but they told us we have to be tolerant. Well, I went to the principal and sure enough, the principal told me to mind my own business. Well, I have a bad habit of sticking my nose in business where it concerns our children. So I went, first of all, to the classroom. Not only were the pictures up there, but there were pages from the homosexual newspaper advertising for young boys and animals and everything else that they want. So then I told the principal, you know, if those pictures do not come down, I'm going to the media. And I did, and they came down. But I'm no longer at the school, so I'm sure they are back up. And there are not many who are going to complain because of what happened to me. You cannot stay within the school system and be politically incorrect or speak out against these programs. Many teachers try not to get involved, but I don't know how you cannot be involved when you see what's going on in our classrooms. And it's not just uh, the homosexual movement, and I've mentioned the others to you, but it's all kind of, of programs that's designed to take the child away from the family in terms of its loyalty. And I'm sure many, many parents, good parents, teach their children right from wrong. But when they get to school, it's, hey, what does old mom and dad know? I, it's your, do your own thing. It's your values. And who can tell you who's right and who's wrong? That's what that 1962 act did. There is no such thing as right or wrong anymore. Well, I would explain to my children right from wrong. And as I talk to them about immigration, for example, it may not be a problem here from you, but it will be. Because the people have realized, as my students tell me, we're on a year-round schedule. We work four months, they're in school four months, and then we're off two months. Well, they go home to Mexico. And then they come back and we laugh and talk about our vacations. And the first thing they say to me is, Ms. Foster, our people over there, our families think you Americans are so stupid. There is no way that 
a you could come to Mexico and get away with what we come here and do. We're the laughing stock of the world because we are not controlling our borders. And for many, many years, I wondered why, why both Democrats and Republicans, they will not control our borders. You cannot protect your people if you do not control your borders. Why? They want open borders because they want America to go from being an independent nation to an interdependent nation. And I don't think that's what you want. And if our children knew better, they wouldn't want it either. But they don't know better. Why? They do not know what their freedoms are. They do not know of the three basic freedoms granted of by the Declaration of Independence because they don't teach in the Declaration anymore. Because you might have to mention the Creator or Providence or the righteousness from heaven. So it's not mentioned. And our children think their, their right is for the government to take care of them. Their right is for the government to redistribute the wealth so that they can have what all the rich people have. They don't understand the liberty that they have here. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, property. All of that's going by the wayside as long as we remain in the United Nations. Our private property, well, we see how the environmentalists are making sure that we lose that over some little rat of some kind or whatever they, they find that should not become extinct while we lose our property. And they also make sure that our families and our children are divorced from each other because it takes a village to raise a child. <laughs> we all know it takes parents whose authority is not undermined by this meddling socialist government now in control of our country. That is what it takes. And it's going to take us to get back in and take over our schools. The only way I can see we, we can do that, folks, is to get government out of it completely. Now, many people go berserk when I say that. And many people wonder, well, oh, what are we going to do? And this thing about putting these labels on our children, mm. at risk, impoverished, poor. I tell you, I am so glad these euphemisms were not around when I was growing up poor that people didn't tell me because I was poor, I was at risk. Poor means your pocket's empty, not your mind. Poor children can learn just like any other children if they're taught properly. So there's a, a problem here with this. Whenever I think about these euphemisms, I tell you, I'm, I'm, I remember the story about uh, Winston Churchill, when he came to America and a luncheon buffet was served in his honor at which fried chicken was served. And he went for his second helping and he asked, could I have a breast? And his hostess said, oh no, Mr. Churchill, in America it's dark meat or white meat. So the next day, Mr. Churchill sent his hostess a beautiful cassage with the note, I'd be much obliged if you pin this to your white meat. <laughs> so, so much for euphemisms. But the reason, the reason that they put these labels on our children is because there's a program that they want to experiment on our children with, and there's more money for that program. Now, you hear all the time that the problem with education is that we're not spending enough money. That is not true. And the success, if you look at our homeschooling, um, the parents who are homeschooling, how successful they are. You saw the spelling bee we had recently, where the homeschool girl won it. And the teachers unions and the rest of them were so upset because the girl shows so much exuberance. Well, that's what competition is all about, isn't it? Isn't that what they do on the football field after a f touchdown? Well, that was a touchdown. But again, they do not want com competition. Competition can be healthy. But that's not the way it's presented to our young people. So we have all of these problems in all of these groups. And I want to say to you, we are all Americans first and foremost. And don't think that because you're white, you can't tell what's happening in a black life, or because we're black, we can't tell what's happening in a white life. We're all human beings. We all bleed red. We all know pain. 
I mean, it hurts me just as much to get slapped by a white as it would to a black. Pain is pain. But we have to, we hear these things about, oh, you don't know because you're not one of us. You know, when I went to school to learn and to prepare myself to become a teacher, I didn't go there to teach green children. I went there to teach children. We were taught in educational psychology because all children go through a psychology as they're growing up. And it is up to us to steer them in the right direction. But the reason you hear these things is because, again, to divide. Divide our children. And I tell you, I get totally confused sometimes about just what it is the leadership want. I can remember growing up in Houston, not far from my high school, there was Houston College for Negroes, and then a few blocks down was University of Houston. Well, of course, the NAACP filed a lawsuit to integrate, and so the Texas legislature said, okay, we, the schools are so close, we'll merge, make them one. The NAACP says, oh, no, we want our black schools. Now, I was in high school, but I was confused by that. But again, you know, in high school, you're, you're trying to live as a child, but, and you think as a child. But when I became an adult, I began to question a number of things that, that's going on and the big lie that's being told to the people. And I have to tell you, I've always felt this way, and I've, I've had equal time in both parties, uh, so I'm not pushing one party here over another. When I reached voting age at 21 at the time, I registered and became a Democrat. I mean, what else did you know in the black community in the South but being a Democrat? It's almost like the story of the little girl who was watching her mother prepare a chicken for roast, and then she says, Mom, why did you cut the wings off the chicken before you put it in the pot? And the mother said, Oh, I don't know. I guess because my mother always did it. So the little girl went to the grandmother. She says, Grandmother, I asked my mother why she cuts the wings off of the chicken before she puts it in the pot, and she says she did it because you did it. Why do you do it? And the grandmother says, oh, I don't know. I guess because my mother did it. So the little girl fortunately had her great-grandmother still living, and she asked her great-grandmother, you know, I asked my mother, I asked grandma, and they both said that they did it because they saw the other do it. Why did you do it? She says, because the pot was too little and the chicken was too big, so that's what I had to do. <laughs> so what we did, we just followed in our parents' footsteps. They were, and you know, something that bothered me, my parents would always go to vote. Now, this was long before the 60s, but our young children today, they think we could not have voted before the 60s. Nowhere in America were blacks allowed to vote. So that's the distortion, the lies that's being presented to our young children. Um, universities, they really believe that prior to the 60s that we were not attending major universities. I tell you, when I graduated from high school in 55, I had a couple of C's too many, and I didn't have the grades to get into the big universities. But my girlfriend, very, very bright, did. So she went on to one of the major universities, and I went to the local school, which is now Texas Southern University. That was the name changed to the school. I got a good education there. She got a good education where she was. I couldn't compete with her in high school. I know I couldn't have competed with the people in college. So what I'm saying to you is that when we tell children that we're going to give you extra points to get into college based upon the color of your skin, we're not doing them a favor. I had a, a, a very good friend that I work with, she's an adult now, had a visit with me recently, and we were talking about affirmative action, and most of my friends are very liberal, I have to tell you, I preach all the time. But I was surprised when she told me that she was against affirmative action, and I said, really? And I said, I'm surprised to hear you say that. And she says, well, it's on my experience. She said, I went to Georgetown University from 76 to 80. And when I got there, there were 20 blacks that entered in there with me. Eight of us were admitted on, the, on our merits alone. The others were given extra points because they were minorities or communities where they were from, or basically because of their skin color. And she said, Four years later, of the 20 of us who enrolled, eight of us graduated. The eight who were let in on their merit. 
And she said, I felt so sorry for the others because their hopes were really up there, but there was just no way that they could compete. That is a real tragedy, folks. It's a real tragedy. And that is what's happening in, in our society now because we're playing the race card and no one's playing it better today than the Billary administration, the race card. Here is um, our, the president who's setting up a commission to study race relations, race reconciliation, and this thing about reparations for slavery. You know, the issue of slavery was answered with the Civil War and two amendments to the Constitution. Get over it, folks. It's over. It's behind us. But what we're doing is we're, we're calling for enslaving everyone with these policies that we're coming up with. In our public schools today, our children are not learning to read, to write, to think. They are learning about all of the social issues. When Nelson Mandela came to town, the schools let out. All of the school buses rolled loaded with our children, thanks to the teachers' union and the school board, so that they could fill up the Coliseum. When Bootha Lacey came to town, complete silence. Now, both these men were friends. They even grew up as friends in South Africa. And both were from well-to-do families. They parted ways on how they would fight apartheid, not whether or not they both would. And the idea of using the necklace to intimidate people, the way that it was used in South Africa is, to me, is the most horrendous thing. Now, when Winnie Mandela came to town and she raised her fist saying, with the necklace we will liberate, and these children are just having a ball, clapping, they didn't know. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the necklace, you may recall when the media first started um, televising uh, funerals of a slain ANC Conrad, and you saw thousands of African people marching behind them. What had happened in 1976, young children were taken from the poor shanty town, ages 6 to 14, and they were trained in PLO training camps. And so they were brought back in, and it was their job when it was time for a funeral to make all of the people come out to go to the funeral. And if one neighbor said, no, I don't want to participate, then that neighbor had his hands tied behind him. All of the other villages were um, surrounded in a circle to watch as this person with the hands tied behind him had an automobile tie filled with gasoline put around his neck set a fire and once the fire started there was no stopping as the rubber would melt into the body now believe me if that were being going on if that occurred in your village you would march behind them also now they don't teach this to our young children. They just thought a necklace, oh, that must be really nice, a gold necklace. That is what I mean about not educating our children. Our schools have become socialist training camps. And that is why I say to you, there's only one way, one way to change it, and that's to get rid of public education altogether. There is no other way. They keep telling you about reforms reform this and reform that, but you still have those teachers' unions in there, and you still have school boards who are geared towards this world citizen that they're going to make our children, towards teaching our children that, in fact, even our, our history books now um, give very little history about America. What is given is so distorted, but they're teaching our children that the only way we'll have peace is through the United Nations. I understand that the United Nations flag is flying in some of these schools. I know in our city council in some areas in Los Angeles, the people are having a fit because they have recognized the CNN flag flying in, in our council meetings. Um, there's a pledge, I understand now, to world, pledge to the world that's being said. They're going after our children. They have just about taken over. And unless America wakes up and gets strong, and let's have that pioneer spirit of our founding fathers, of those who went before us, who gave us this great nation, 
as I tell my children all the time, of all colors, this land is your land, and it is yours, so it's your heritage. What is the legacy we're leaving our children? As long as we are having public schools, we are not leaving them the America that we have known, a free America. Because once we have allowed ourselves to be completely consumed by the UN, we can say goodbye to our liberties. There are people that complain about separation of church and state. We are free to worship at whatever church we want in America. How long do you think that will last with the UN deciding what church, if any, they will recognize? There are those whose only issue is abortion. And it's a great issue because a nation that kills its young will not long survive. And there is no reason. There are those who talk about, oh, it's just a little mass of tissue. Don't bother it, and it's life. So I say to them, join us in this bandwagon because under UN directives, you don't have a choice. Death and life will occur as it pleases the state. Too many people? We have to get rid of some. Need more workers here in this area? We might have to, okay, you can have more than one baby or two babies or what have you. So these are the kind of freedoms that I'm talking about, folks. It's not a matter of just fighting one little issue here. We've got to come together. We are talking about this great nation of ours. And the one sure way for us to cease to exist as a nation at all, is for us to become a tangle of squabbling nationalities. And that is exactly what's happening in our public schools. And this is why we have to take this bold step. Now, I know that there are those who say, well, what are, what are the poor going to do if schooling were left up to the parents and the community? Best thing that could ever happen to America the best thing that could ever happen to America. As far as money is concerned, just a few weeks ago, designer Carol Little gave a beautiful state-of-the-arts building to a community there for them to run it as their school. It will be fully equipped, fully financed, until they're able to get on their feet and raise their own funds. No government funding, no government dictates. Well, listen, we just had Ted Turner to give, what is it, a billion dollars to the UN? Well, I wonder, you know, I was about to say perhaps we could get Uncle Sam out and get Uncle Ted in, but we would have the same kind of program, so we wouldn't want to do that. But there are those out there that do have money that I'm sure there's got to be businesses out there who recognize what's happening to our great nation and would be willing to help us make the change. But it really doesn't take that much money. It really, have you picked up the old primers that were used in early education and looked at those? There's so much material out there that you can use for your students, for your children, that it would work. And I know that there are many educated people in all of these communities who would be willing to help our children and our parents. So let us not be weak-kneed. We must be strong, and we must take that bold action, and that is what we need to do. And it is not only in the way that we worship that's threatened. It is not only in our young lives that are being aborted hourly, minute by minute. It is also the kind of families that we want, the tradition, the American traditional family. I remember I was speaking at Pepperdine University and there were some young boys sitting up front and I said, you know, um, everybody asked me, what does Americans for Family Values stand for, which is our organization? And I said, well, we want you to know we believe in love and marriage before baby and carriage. And I thought those young men would fall out of their seats laughing. <laughs> because that's so foreign to them now. They, they have no idea what that means. And I told them, I said, you know, if you were as bold with young girls in my day, you would have been at a shotgun wedding. You get that girl pregnant, you were going to marry her. 
And I tell you, some people say, well, you know, that may have not have been good, but it's better than what we have today. There are so many young children that are without a father in the home, and some the mothers have there. There's so many grandmothers raising these children. What has happened? I know families are good families, and they've tried, and they've done the best they could. But again, here you have a school that's working against what the families want for their children. You have a society that every time you turn on the television, whether it's early in the morning, in the middle of the day, or in the early evening, you have graphic sex acts. I don't know if there's a movie made without a graphic sex act. As a matter of fact, I was channel surfing one time, and it was a good movie, a drama. Got into it. Next thing I know, this graphic sex act, we had nothing to do with the program. And to me, it takes away from it. So our children have no innocence anymore. And that's the one thing we have to bring back. Now, in closing, I want to say to you, a lot of people have asked, how is it that my husband and I became members of the John Birch Society? In the more than 11 years that we've been out here fighting, we've met a lot of very fine people in many, many organizations, many organizations that have courted us over the years. But we found that these were organizations that just meet, eat, and retreat. And we didn't have that kind of time. And then um, I happened to have been on Larry Keene's show, and a gentleman out of Utah, Dave Jorgensen, called, got my husband on the telephone, and they were kindred souls from the beginning. And by the time my husband got off of this long telephone conversation, he told me, you're going to be a speaker in Utah at a family God country rally. And that's where I met Dave and his wonderful family. Uh, they were Mormons, and they took us to the Mormon temple, just a beautiful family. But you know how you John Birches do as we were getting ready to leave. Uh, take this book and read it, or here's a magazine, or here's some information. And so we began to read, and, and, and my husband, is, he's not the kind that will jump into anything. So we continued to put it off, and then in June of 96, I did a speaking tour in Northern California, and we met more wonderful birches and got more reading material. So we finally decided that um, this is the organization that's really trying to do something, and this is an organization that believes in America, that believes in God, and believes in a strong nation so and they do something about it so well, that is why we decided to join and one of the coordinators from northern california after learning that we joined called us and he said Isola, you know you and your husband chuck owe us back dues you've been birches a long time <laughs> so um i want to say again it's, it's been such a pleasure to be here and to share some of these views with you and the only answer that I can give you to the problem is the one that I just did. And it's one that I would ask you to pursue strongly and to spread the word. Because I believe that this nation of ours definitely is worth saving. And I believe it will take us to do it. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you. American Perspectives continues momentarily with law professor Derek Bell. Tomorrow night on Book Notes, Alan Shom discusses his recent book, Napoleon Bonaparte. Book Notes, Sunday night at 8 Eastern and Pacific Time, here on C-SPAN. Then at 9, while the House of Commons is on recess, we continue our look at other aspects of British politics. This week, a live viewer call-in program to answer questions on procedures of the House of Commons. The head of Parliament's Public Affairs Office, Chris Pond, will discuss the history of the legislative body, its operations, and how C-SPAN covers Prime Minister's questions. See it Sunday night at 9, Eastern and Pacific.